Hello and welcome to another installment of the Y Football Podcast with me, Michael Dryden and Etches Adokru. With France marching on through the Euros, today we'll be discussing their national football centre, Claire Fontaine, its founding, how it works and its effects on French football. Before we start, please follow us on Twitter at YFootball underscore and subscribe with us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Acast and YouTube. Hello Etches, uh, France are playing Switzerland tomorrow night. So very timely. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks. Can't complain. Um, you know what? When anyone asks you how you're doing, it's very rare. You just say, "Oh, terrible." You know? <laughs> uh, hate my hate my life. Personally, you uh, hate. Like it's one of those things, right? Where whenever you ask it, it's just a, it's a foregone conclusion that you're going to say, "I'm fine." Because if you don't know the person that well, right, the last thing you want is like their whole life story like you know what mate you should have just said you're okay <laughs> you separate ways I, I don't want to yeah. hear about your broken tea mug in the office <laughs> maybe i'll start asking just random questions just asking <laughs> just, just so people can find out about a bit more about you etches because when i <laughs> when i ask how are you yeah i know what you mean it's um particularly when it's going out to people like what are you gonna say like they've just started listening to it you're not gonna be like oh yeah pretty pretty dreadful in the foul mood yeah the podcast gonna go well isn't it <laughs> <laughs> don't want to record this to be honest uh, yeah yeah hit my life hit the podcast <laughs> <laughs> well you know I'm, I'm good i'm quite excited to see uh, holland versus czech republic later and also you've got the big one portugal belgium as well Indeed. i feel like that will be underwhelming because i'm not entirely convinced by portugal nor am i particularly convinced by belgium i think belgium have a star-studded front but I'm not too sure about the back. So we'll see how that game kind of unfolds. I think if KDB uh, wiggles his wand, then I think they'll they'll do quite well. Mm. Yeah, true. I agree with that. Yeah, because I mean, both teams defensively, I mean, Belgium have got Alderweireld, Song and we've seen Vermaelen fit in there. All AJ and you've got Denier and uh, uh, Boyata as well. It's not like a strong back line. Um, so there could be goals there and Portugal have shipped some goals as well in their group. So it makes for a lot of goals, but We'll see. I think I'm looking forward to the knockout. I've started already, but I'm looking forward to them generally because I just felt like the groups were like friendlies. And you've got eight teams out there, what, 24 that don't go through. So it's like, I mean, England's group, it was just like, it's just like friendlies, mate, because you're, you're, you're likely to go through. So why bother, you know, and especially in our group where the winner played against the group of death. <laughs> it was like, what's the benefit of winning the group? So it was just so lackluster. So I'm hoping, particularly when England play, that we, um, it's a bit more urgency, it's a bit more going on, so it can actually have some hope for the rest of the tournament. But, but we'll see. But anyway, so France are marching on. Well, can you, can you, can you, can you hear that in the background? No, uh, it's people booing you because, uh, mate, third place playoffs that they work. The third place thing in the Euros works. Oh man, it works. Uh, mate, What's the point of the, the groups? To, mate, tell it to the mob outside. I, the thing is, I like the fact there's more teams, yeah? I like the fact we have an yeah. extra round. I don't want it to be like a round robin of like one group and there's a final. <laughs> like, I like the fact that there's loads of groups, um, loads of, t- and sorry, loads of, uh, a lot more teams. But I just, you know, third place going through. What well, Denmark lost their opening two games and then went through. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Denmark now because of what happened with Ericsson, et cetera, going to get more booze. But <laughs> <laughs> you're losing two out of three games and going through, man. Come on. Yeah, these banged up Wales. What? Oh, Wales! What? They, they, what? They beat Russia and Wales. Go on, I'm with that. I'm gonna put my mic down so I can applaud. Two <laughs> <laughs> we can hear that. I might, I might put some in. <laughs> yeah, but Wales were your powerhouse from uh, Group A, weren't they? Oh uh, yes, and that's a good thing to mention. Thank you for mentioning that because I got <laughs> a lot of heat for saying that Turkey would come bottom. And to be fair, there's a lot of people. They did well in qualifying. There's a lot of people saying. They've got a good side now. They haven't done so well in, in recent years. But then I looked at their team. Don't get me wrong, I'm not an expert, expert on Turkish football. But I didn't really recognise that many players. Didn't recognise many from top European leagues or clubs. It's players like, you know, Yilmaz, um, who I recognised, and Kanhaglu and Soyuncu. But I thought, are these that good? And then they came bottom. So um, I just think, lesson for anyone listening, I speak pure gospel. Um <laughs> and that, that's basically it. I think what I, what I say is pure gospel and, you know, any predictions are going to happen. So, Claire Fontaine, why this episode? I, yeah, we did a pod a while ago on England's DNA, which was said to be inspired by Claire Fontaine. For the terrible, terrible, terrible people listening who didn't listen to that fantastic episode, Awful. that was on um, 
it kind of like England's rejuvenation of their youth development football. So the building of St. George's Park and kind of how they were going to become a European powerhouse again. And yeah. a lot of the ideas kind of stemmed from uh, Clairefontaine, which is in France. You know, it fits in really well because the Euros are on at the moment and also because France's poster boy, Kylian Mbappe, on Remark 2, is yeah. from the academy itself. Um, you know, it's one of those institutions where people talk about quite a lot don't really know what it is. Is it a team? You know, where do they play? All this sort of stuff. No one really knows yeah. that much about it. So, you know, with their recent success in 2018 and the double of 98, 2000, I kind of wanted to look more into Claire Fontaine and his foundings and kind of how it works because they've had brilliant players come through there looking at Thierry Henry, legend, and Nell Kerf. Yeah, he was, he's pretty good, but he did leave Arsenal. Kylian Mbappe, <laughs> Blaise Matuidi and Olivier Giroud, uh, all brilliant players. To add to that, we've got uh, Rafael Guerrero, who's playing currently as well, uh, Mehdi Benatia. There's so many players uh, that, that have come through that system, Abu Dhabi um, as mm. well. Yeah, true. I mean, it's a vast number of graduates. I mean, it's a bit of a spoiler for the rest of the pod, but what is interesting is the amount of players that come through and that went on to play for other nations uh, due to like dual nationality, which is quite interesting. So, uh, so start 50 players at the FIFA World Cup in 2018 um, were born in France. Now, I was thinking about this number. Is that actually a lot? I mean, it's probably you know, it's 25 in each squad, but it is almost like obviously you've got the France squad and then another squad worth of players that were all born in France and would have been eligible for their team playing for other nations. Um, obviously, they, they didn't all come through Cliff on Tain, um, but it's an indication of how you know the nation is, is really getting things right at the academy level. Yeah, I think France is a really interesting one because of its former colonies in Western Africa mm. uh, and because of the way dual nationality works in football. I mean, I mentioned Rafael Guerrero, who uh, those of you who are on the buzzer know he plays for Portugal, but yeah. he is in fact born in France, raised in France yeah. to a dad that was also, I believe, raised in France, but his granddad was Portugal. So the, the, so the dad had a Portuguese passport and is Portuguese and therefore Guerrero decided to play for Portugal because that's what he wanted to do. And it's quite interesting how that can, how different it is for each player. I think France is quite a common one because a lot of these guys are from predominantly Western Northern Africa. Some of them do end up playing for those countries. And then Mehdi Benatia decided to play for, I believe it's Algeria. Um, it's, Mor- it's Morocco. No, yeah, it's Morocco. It's Morocco. Yeah, I remember seeing this. So I remember in the 18 World Cup, their squad actually being quite good. Uh, players like Benatia and Gordon. Um Yeah, I think it's it's quite lax, isn't it? It's quite the to be able to. It, it seems quite easy to an extent to be able to move between nations well, <laughs> in a national level. I think here we benefit from massively. I mean, we've got two players in the squad that have England. Oh no, one has an Irish cap. Well, I think yes, three. I think Declan Rice played for Ireland three times, but they were friendlies. We had Jack Grealish, who played most of his youth ball in the Irish setup and then moved to England. Mm. I think as a home nation, England really do benefit from predominantly all of the best talent that has dual nationality on these shores end up playing for England. So I think where France get the benefit of former countries and colonies, I think England definitely get the best of the crop um, from the other well, British Well, it, it does work both both ways. I mean, a great example of that was uh, Danny Higginbottom playing for Gibraltar. Um, so <laughs> that's <laughs> former Southern player. And just to, just to mention before we move on, um, I checked on Wikipedia and there was no Southern, Southern players or former Southern players that came through Claire Fontaine. So anyone listeners would be very interested by that. So, just <laughs> so, so what precisely is Claire Fontaine? Claire Fontaine is also known as the INF Claire Fontaine or the Institut National de Football de Claire Fontaine, mm. uh, which is the National Football Centre that specialises in training French players. The academy is one of the 13 elite academies located in and around France that are supervised by the France Football Federation or the Triple F. Only mm. the best players from the Ile de France region are selected to train at the Claire Fontaine academy and kind of why it came about was because prior to the establishment of Clairefontaine France weren't very good um, yeah. at international level in terms of football and, you know they'd never won any trophies in comparison to their neighbours Italy and Germany during the 60s and Spain and England as well because uh, looking back whenever they were thinking about it England actually had just won the World Cup yeah. rather than it being a lifetime ago now um, this decided to force France to establish a centre to kind of catch up so in 76, uh, the president of the federation, Fernand Sastre, desired to create a football national centre. And the project was initiated by a guy called Stefan Kovac, 
who was inspired by uh, Romanian communist uh, training centers. Fun fact, you actually, big fact coming in here. These are only Frenchmen, the only non Frenchmen to manage France. Yeah, I did have that down on my, my notes as well, but I'm, I'm ah, happy, you walled, it, I'm happy uh, that you walled it off. Apologies. Yeah, yeah, because on a small side note, the biggest nations are always managed by countrymen. I know England had dallied with um, Ericsson, Ericsson and Capello, uh, bottom tier, but they did <laughs> um, still go abroad. But yeah, it's quite rare for the big nations to do that. So yeah. Um, yeah, whole time, Stefan. Good lad. And uh, six years later, after France's victory at Euro 1984, the FFF decided to select uh, the Clairefontaines on Yvelines as the site for the centre. Um, the construction commenced during the 1985 and lasted for about three years. It opens its doors in 1988. Eight. During the 1998 World Cup, which France hosted, the Clairefontaine hosted the French national team. Mm, another big fact coming up here, which is at the 98 World Cup, Stéphane Guivache, so a striker for France, played a number of games, didn't score a single goal for France in that World Cup, which is an interesting fact because 20 years later, nor did Olivier Giroud. So just throwing facts at you here, HS. Um, you know, you don't have to duck now and again, just throwing some hot facts. So yeah, just, I just would... keep up. I watched the World Cup final and he looked absolutely abysmal, uh, Stefan Guivarch. Uh, he didn't play for France much after that uh, World Cup triumph as well, unlike Giroud, who's still uh, kicking about today, which is which is good for him. Mm. So, so the selection process for Claire Fontaine is quite uh, rigorous. Um, they have to be between 13 and 15 years of age, have a French citizenship, and live or play in the surrounding Ile-de-France, saint martin or the Yale regions. Uh, players train at Clairefontaine from Sunday to Friday evening before heading off to play for their local clubs mm. at the weekend. Another reason for Clairefontaine's success is the philosophy of creating like a habitable training environment for its students. You know, many of them come from working class backgrounds. The yep. training is meant to be very rigorous and they have very meticulous approaches and schedules. Um, but the, the familiarity between the trainees and the coaches ensures that any feeling of homesickness or loneliness is kept to a minimum. Obviously, mm. because the players are 13 to 15, they're clothed <laughs> and fed there. Um, and there is an emphasis on academic performance, which is a pod within itself um, about yeah, how, yeah. you know, as much as you want footballers to be as good as they can be, 99% of them aren't going to make it. So it's also about helping them for life after ball, should they not become the next Greasy or Henri. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've done a fair bit of reading on this on this topic, and one thing that's not clear is um, do these do these players represent club academies at all during this time, or is it something they do at weekends, or do they just join academies when they're fifteen? Which seems quite late because the academy system around the world and in England, you know, have, you have players that join uh, under eight systems are set up, sorry, right through to to when they become pro. So it's not particularly clear, but. Yeah, I'm just. This was a question that, that's been raised in my mind: is whether you know these players are playing at club academies in France or just wait until the 15. It seems quite late. Yeah, it does. I think it's one of those. Well, it's one of those things which is quite um, on a case by case basis. I mean, France aren't doing too bad at international level, so I think I think they can definitely be part of an academy, join Clairefontaine, and then go back to an academy after. I doubt it would depend on the situation whether the academies would let them just play on the weekends and not yeah. at all. It would probably yeah. be very local football, I would assume. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things I reckon is on a case-by-case -case basis. And if they're practically living at Clairefontaine as well, and the club would then therefore have to be local. <laughs> so how yeah, many exactly. professional football clubs be local? I mean, they can't be playing in Marseille if they're in Paris. And this... <laughs> yeah. well, so... Exactly. But then that also ties into the fact that they... Um... They have to be living in near the region anyway. So would you yeah. get so for example, if it's talking about Kylian Mbappe, he has to live within that region, so he wouldn't be out at a Marseille Academy anyway. Yeah, true. It has to be something like Paris Saint Germain, which, exactly. be, which would cater a lot for them. No, exactly that. So kind of what I wanted to focus on next is um what they focus on in training because this illustrious um set up, you know, what, what are they what are they actually teaching their players to make them so good? So the youth development incorporates many principles on football with students learning stuff like making player movements faster and better, linking movements more efficiently, using the weaker foot, psychological mm. tests, which is sports personality tests in terms of like making the right decisions on the pitch, medical factors, technical skills, skills training and tactical to help the players uh, you know, you know, be in the right areas on the pitch and know who to pass the ball to, etc. But this is exactly where 
Clairefontaine deviates. You know, this unique methodology uh, you prioritizes players, uh, it gears them towards winning. And I think that is the primary focus on France. And this deviates from other cultures. What we spoke about just then is specifically traits which are generalized. And when we speak yeah. about the best Spanish teams, uh, total football Dutch teams, even England to an extent, in terms of maybe direct fast football, mm-hmm. what is France's style? And I think what their style kind of is at Clairefontaine is the, the ability to produce winners, the, the ability to produce players that are malleable to the team to then be able to flourish and win rather than a specific style of player compared to La Masia. Yeah. La Masia, ball control, guys who are tidy, you know, working in small technical spaces that produces different but similar types of players. Total Dutch football is the same where everyone plays the same position and they all kind of grow in the same format. But France are very much about getting unique individuals catered towards winning for the team, which is why when you look at their profiles of these players, it can vary quite drastically, which I think is quite interesting. Um, I think the framework as well also is extremely detailed, uh, which I just mentioned just then. And the coaches, which is interesting, are monitored all the time. Uh, the coaches as well, to put a bit of spotlight on them, must consider the player's age and setting objectives relative to the player so they can actually improve. Um, and they must be helpful, accurate and efficient. The hairdryer treatment that Sarex Ferguson like to use <laughs> and repetitive criticism is heavily frowned upon, which is another interesting point as well, is because when we think about local football here, Academy football here, um, which is now changing, but let's talk about maybe Academy football in the 90s. I think uh, the hair dry treatment would be quite frequent for young boys and it all comes into how can we best help young players grow and flourish. And I think Claire Fontaine was kind of ahead of its time, uh, which is why England's always playing this, this, this catch up to try and get to that sort of level. Yeah, for, football here seems quite rigid, and quite serious, which doesn't actually lend itself to children flourishing, does it? No. <laughs> they flourish in more creative and in happier environments. When um, I never played in the academy myself, but uh, when I was younger, I used to play where we play some games at like the actual grounds and stuff, and you play against like some of the academy teams and certain games, and it always seemed like a really, really serious. And it was a very professional setup. I mean, they are professional football clubs, but you know, some of these kids, you've got kids who are like ten years old playing football. They, it needs to be a bit more creative, I think, to be. Um, to help them flourish, which might not be how it is in Clairefontaine exactly, but as you said, they're trying to move away from perhaps screaming at players and making things <laughs> difficult for them to try and force progress rather than try and encourage it. Um, I read a quote. I read a quote from um, the director of the Clairefontaine, uh, Jean- Jean-Claude Lefar- Lefargue. It's a great correct pronunciation. He likened their their approach to developing an actor for their role. So if an actor is cast to play a sad part in a role then they will be de- developed to play a sad part in a role, that particular role, that particular character. And so the, the philosophy, as you say, is more around developing individual players in particular traits to, to kind of benefit the collective rather than getting the whole unit to kind of play in a certain philosophy in a certain way, um, which is interesting. It's an interesting analogy um, for a system that works so well. La Masia works well, but again, it's, it's, it's an interesting comparison. And I've seen a lot of comparisons between Clairefontaine and La Masia, but La Masia is a, it's not a national academy, is it? It's a, it's a, um, it's a it's a football club's academy. It's a single football club's academy. So mm. um, it's it's a bit different. But their philosophy is deep rooted in the history of kind of one club, like FC Barcelona. You know, Jorgen Kroos influence there. Um, but I think it's interesting that you have that comparison because there seemingly isn't another national t- <laughs> institution that compares with it. So uh, it kind of shows how they're kind of pioneering in that in that kind of field and and in the academy in the academy structures. Yeah, massively. I think that's a really really good point and. Yeah, I mean, there there are a few national national setups in in different countries, but I think France yeah. was very ahead of its time, um, and I think it's quite interesting as to how established has become. And the reason why I mentioned the Messi before and all these other clubs is because they've all taken little bits from uh, Clairefontaine to implement into their own various setups and systems. I mean, the the final point is: is it still working? So that's one of the big questions I thought about with Clairefontaine. And the reason why I thought about that is: oh, the poster boy Kylian Mbappe came from Clairefontaine, but when you Google it and you read about the players that have come through there, the striking thing is how old most of the players are. So when yeah. we hear about all the success stories, which, you know, there, there are loads, you know, they're from the generation just gone. So we're talking Nicolas Anelka, retired, Abu Dhabi, retired, William Gallas, probably retired, Louis Saha, retired, Olivier Giroud is 34, Jimmy mm-hmm. Briand, I don't know where he is now. Jimmy Briand, he's a Bordeaux. Yeah, oh, there it is. is. 
Josh Gomaja went there from Sunderland, but yeah. Move. Carry uh, on. <laughs> Jerome Ruffin, uh, Philippe Christenval, oh, Atem, Ben Arthur, Blaise Matuidi, like the, the non French ones. We've got Sebastian Bassong, Yassine Brahimi, Rafael Guerrero is quite young, to be fair, but a lot of these players are, are, are older. It could be that I don't have the latest bits of information as to players that have come through there, but it was more of a case of is Clairefontaine still as useful as it once was, or is it that other different academies in France and setups are more lucrative for yeah. players? to come through um you know even i know that clubs always miss talent there's always a an yeah, exception course, a player yeah. that they missed so you know when you see in the likes of people like anthony marshall and Nagolo kante not making it uh you, you do wonder if the academy is still as good as it once was you I mean it was embroiled in a discrimination row uh where fff were looking to secure players for france and they were aiming to cap the number of players of dual nationalities now on a side note we, we rarely we try and mostly stick on football but france has massive problems with race in their country and nationality as like like a identity mm. so that is quite saddening to read that they're trying to limit the number of dual nationality players involved yeah i mean there was talk of tweaking the selection process for 12 year olds as well which was uh, widely criticized in the french media because they wanted loads of arab heritage french born players to miss out uh, because of this tightening on this dual nationality, mm. um, w- w- which which is quite sad to read, but with the grander landscape of the country, doesn't particularly surprise me. Uh, the issue of the Claire Fontaine as well is that the methods are becoming outdated, and coaches are relying on more size and strength rather than technical superiority, which I think loads of countries can be guilty of, mm. and in particular France, because when we're talking about winners, uh, and we're talking about you know the era of the 1998-2000 era, I think France would look at the success of those teams and think, right, we had Patrick Vieira and Emmanuel Petit. We need players like that now. Yeah, Not really compensating for the fact that you can have Nagolo Kant and just be as successful. But there is always that argument that coaches can be lenient towards those who are bigger and stronger at youth level because they're more powerful and will always thrive. Kind of like how... Japan at the World Cup were very technically gifted. I thought they had a very good setup. But people always said they will always get overpowered because physically, in terms of the athlete level, they're not comparative to some of their Western counterparts. Yeah, but particularly in certain areas. I mean, it's perhaps Mm. having that that balance. Uh, If you have... And a full 11 of, t- of players that haven't got the physical attributes, that means you haven't got a two centre half and a goalkeeper that have physical attributes, which you need. Mm. Um, you, you do need. It's interesting to hear that N'Golo Kante and Anthony Martial didn't uh, make the cut for Claire Fontaine. But as you say, you get loads of stories like that. And it's really easy yet, retrospectively to say, oh God, how come that club didn't pick up on this player being exceptional? Um, but, you know, it's all circumstantial. There's a load, loads of players in the setup. And they might not have just they might have just not done that as well at that level and then eventually worked their way up. And I know Anthony Marshall came through um really early in Monaco as a as a player and on the first team. But it's interesting to see he didn't make the make the cut. And I think the whole the whole system seems interesting around training specific like parts, if we go back to the, the actor analogy, um, to play in a and I think the four through three system is the one that they, they predominantly use within that um for, for each team. But it makes it's interesting because football changes so much, and we talk about quite a lot how the football. You've mentioned a lot of time football moves in cycles. It's it's interesting that they they are modelling players in specific specific ways rather than creating or basically creating specialists rather than cre- equipping players with the tools to play in multiple positions. So it's almost like, do we want to produce the next David Alavers who can play all over the all over the pitch, or yeah. do we ne- or do we produce the next kind of Musa Sissoko? It's it's interesting point because then some of the best centre halves in the world. Um, for example, someone like Virgil van Dijk, he's good with his feet, he's good in the air. He is very specifically a, a good centre half. I couldn't see him playing anywhere else. Certain positions do need kind of that specialism, like goalkeeper, for example. But it is to that point if football changes and you've actually created all these players in specific um, specialisms or um, in certain moulds, and then they become redundant those positions, then actually you've just created a generation of players that aren't suitable for this new change in, in the football landscape. So. I find it really, really interesting. And another point as well, um, and it's back to your point of what is it working? And it's almost this, almost this question is of, sorry, is it a case of the fact that France have had two golden generations or is it due to Claire Fontaine and their football academy structure? Um, it would lean towards the latter because two golden generations in the space of 30 years would be quite a lot. Um, mm-hmm. But if you think about the last 20 years, I mean, despite the final, final appearance in 2006, uh, post-2006, there wasn't a lot of success until 2016. I mean, obviously that's only 10 years and that's, what, three tournaments? <laughs> so yeah. you could argue that's a, a, not the right point. But 
it makes you think they are one of the biggest footballing nations in terms of population and co. I know they're not one of the biggest populations in the world, but in terms of like an advanced footballing nation, they are very populous. You've also got the, the links with the, the West African colonies and such like. So is it more a fact that they've got more opportunity to bring footballers through? They've also, and it's the final point, <laughs> they they've also got a very unique domestic league in the sense that they're a big footballing nation. They're a big nation generally in terms of population as well, but their domestic league isn't that popular and isn't that successful compared to the other sort of top five. So yeah, like true. with the Eredivisie and the Belgian league, I've mentioned this a number of times that you have this, you almost have this, this kind of breeding ground there where you've got a good footballing nation, a big population, you've got the West African colony links, you've got Claire Fontaine, and they can come through in their domestic league at a good age, like 18 or 17. Look at Kamil Vinga, mate. He's, he's playing, he played like 30, he made like 40 appearances for uh, Rons at like 16 or 17. Like that's yeah, so early to make it? that at the top level. And they've got like someone like Jude Bellingham playing championship football, which is great, but having to come through there, someone like Jaden Sancho having to go abroad because he can't get game time. And I think that's a massive factor to, to try as well. I do, I do think France is a very unique setup in terms of its league and how it's able to blood youth players. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see kind of how Claire Fontaine develops over a longer period of time because I think with all of these academies and so when they have a period of success like France did at the turn of the century, it's how do you build from that? I think there is an argument, like you said, of not that much success post-2006 and the retiring of a lot of those players from that era of trying to blood this new era of players and whether Claire Fontaine or the other elite academies are doing as much as they possibly can to get those players ready, essentially. Yeah, no, agreed. I and mean, we are starting to see it in England now more players come through earlier. Um, players like Phil Forden, for example, but they are kind of the, I mean, they, they're the anomaly because they're the, the best of the crop. But you're not seeing that rest of the. You still don't think you're seeing the rest of like, the youth developments coming. Uh, youth players who are developing coming through and playing regular uh, first team football in the top league. So I think that's definitely a factor. So Eches, I think we'll we'll wrap up there. Thank you so much for the insight on um, Claire Fontaine. Uh, France played tomorrow against Switzerland. Um, so they could already be through or out <laughs> by the time yeah. that we uh, this goes live. Um, or well, it'll be, it'll be live, but before people listen. Um, and yeah, we'll see what happens with that. But exciting to see what England do as well on Tuesday. And hopefully we'll go through because there is a decent run to the final. But yeah, thank you, Etches. And yeah, yeah, thank you all for listening. And we'll, we'll see you next time. Brilliant. Cheers, guys.